this, I guess, is the actual first lesson in a series, seeing as last week it was more of an uh, introduction. This is more of week one of studies. Now, if you go to watch last week's online, my head was cut off like the entire time. So <laughs> I moved the camera back and I moved myself a little bit further back. Uh, but today, if you can't read that, it, it says, first of all, how to study the Bible for all it's worth, uh, kind of the, the running title for this series. But the, the word we're looking at today is backgrounds. Um, if you're in part of, if you're in part of any crime scene investigation, if you uh, watch the SI and CIS, you know, Bones, Criminal Minds, anything, you know that backgrounds are very important to understanding the situation. You got to know what people were doing, where it was happening. You can't just come into a crime and go, oh, it's this person. You can't just go into a crime and, re and, and look at something and assume you know because more than likely there's a story behind it. There's a, a way of going about it that we need to understand before we get down to what we know. So in the Bible, when we go to study the Bible, we have to look at the background of the book we're studying, which is what we're going to do today, in the context of itself, what is, you know, what is the book, what do we need to know about the book to really understand it, but also what do we need to know about the book's placement in the Bible to really get the, the broad scheme. Because we, ha we start you know, with the analogy my professors all the time, we start looking at a forest. You know, the Bible is a forest uh, filled with trees. But as we start narrowing our topic, we go from um, the trees to a small section to maybe two or three more trees, and then one specific tree, and then a branch on that tree. That's kind of how we get down to what we're studying. So when we're looking at John chapter 2, verses 1, that's kind of like that stick on the tree in the forest. So first we have to acknowledge what the forest looks like, what it is, and what's happening. So that's kind of where we're starting today. We're starting this big picture of what is John and the Gospels, and we're going to go down and define you know, what is the book of John, what is it kind of the one you need to be looking at, and what differs it maybe from the other, especially Gospels, but also the rest of the books of the Bible. But let's go ahead and have a word of prayer before we get started. So let's pray. Dear God, I pray that you would open our hearts and open our minds today as we study the book of John. God, I pray that we would be enlightened and um, be shown what it is that, that took place to get to this book that we have today. God, thank you so much for this time that we can come together, and I pray that it would be beneficial um, for everybody here today. In your name we pray. Amen. So one of the first things to talk about when we talk about the book of John is, one, that it's a gospel. Now, for us, that's obvious. You know, that's, that's obvious. We know it's a gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But what that tells us is that this whole thing is going to be about Jesus' life. That is going to be the focus, just like the other Gospels. But, but here's the difference. Now, if you've ever started to read through the New Testament, you've started to read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and you're like, okay, these are kind of similar, the same parables, more than likely the same parables, the same situation. The book of Mark, it, you know, it has a lot to do with the, uh, Matthew and Luke, but when you get to John, you might notice that there is actually a big difference between the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and of John. And what those are called are called the synoptic gospels. So when we study the gospels, we study them in two sections. We study them in what we call the synoptic gospels, and then the other one creatively named John. <laughs> um, you might might uh, um, hear say the Jehonine writings. Um, that's the Book of John, First, Second, and Third John, and Revelation, which we assume John wrote. But for the sake of the gospels and the sake of what we're studying, the difference between the synoptic gospels and the Book of John is really that John has a completely different purpose of writing his book than the other Gospels. And that's key to understanding its placement in the Bible and its placement in our study. 
Now, if you, if you look at the Synoptic Gospels, some of the big differences you'll see are in, in, in the first three Synoptic Gospels, there is one big long journey um, from, uh, uh, from Galilee to Jerusalem. That's kind of the story arc. There's, there's a little bits of places and stuff that things happen, but there's one big long journey. In John, that's not at all how it is. Um, he's actually just in um, Judea, in Jerusalem, often, back and forth, doing different things. Um, and what we start to see is that chronologically, some of the things John says doesn't necessarily make a ton of sense compared to the other three Gospels. Um, and that leads us to ask, you know, one, is John a credible source of Jesus' life? Um, and I believe it is. Um, there is a, another belief that would go to say that John is, uh, you know, quote, the, the first, um, what was it, the, the first commentary on the Gospels. But that doesn't really make much sense, also seeing that John was written in the first century. That's not very, that's not very uh, logical. But uh, modern critical studies of the Bible would say that surely, yes, John wrote accurate account of Jesus because he was a follower of Jesus. Now, we'll get to that here in a minute, but some estimates, I think this is a little high, but, but just, this is how different it is. Some estimates would say that 90% of the material found in John is not found in the Synoptic Gospels. 90%. Now, I, said, I think it's a little high, but I would say at least 80%. John has a completely different take upon Jesus' life. And that's important for when we study the book of John. Because if we study it like we were to study Mark or Luke or Matthew, we would miss so much of the point that John is trying to make in writing this book. So um, some of the new characters you might see in the book of John that you don't see in the other ones are actually really popular. So um, we have Nicodemus, the Samaritan woman at the well, um, Lazarus, just to name a few. Those are just a few very popular names that we know that actually only take place in the book of John. Um, and I think one of the reasons is because the way John writes is so simplistic. And that's, that's a big thing about John. He's so simple, but he's so deep. He's so simple, but he's so deep. Uh, John, and especially if you're even looking at the Greek, which we're not going to study, but he has one of the most simplest writings of Greek in the New Testament. Not, not bad Greek, but he says things very simply. But the more you, you wrestle with them, the deeper they get. Um, I'm trying to think of a, a, a picture that Fred Craddock drew, Ill, illustrated in your mind. Um, he said, John is shallow enough for a baby to float in and deep enough for an element, elephant to swim in. Now, if you think about it, those two things should not happen in the same place. But it's so true in the book of John because you can read it at a very surface level. And it's very understandable. A lot of times if you're going to start somebody um, as a disciple, somebody who needs to know who God is, John is a great place to start because it's so simple. But it's also very, very deep. But... Uh, so what we have to, to examine and what we have to understand is we have to ask the question, is John a historical um, account of Jesus? Uh, if we do look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke as very accurate, and we do 100% believe they are, very accurate timeline, very accurate understandings, if we look at John and just simply compare the two, um, they would seem, John would seem to kind of lack off or slack off on the historical um, context of the historical truth in Jesus' life. But that's not true at all, actually. Um, you know, uh, we see later in the book of John, I'll go ahead, um, if someone wants to flip to John chapter 20, verse 31, um, we'll go ahead and sort of get the context um, of why this book was written as well. 
And let me know whoever gets there first, you can just start reading it. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So go ahead and read that one more time. Read it again, um, just so we can get the context of what is going on. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So this is the point of why John is writing. John does not say, okay, like Luke we know, um, John does not say, hey, you know, I'm trying to line up everything that happened historically with Jesus to prove that Jesus was truly there. No, that's not at all. He, he opens assuming, first of all, a lot of things. One, that Jesus was true. There, there's no, I mean, if you read the Gospels, there's no trying to prove that, to show that Jesus is alive. This happened soon after. I mean, at the most, maybe one generation has passed off. But we know John, an apostle, was still living. So there was a ton of people who were still alive at that time. So John did not have to um, try to defend the histor historicity of this character named Jesus. Everyone knew he was already a person. So it's important to understand, if we look to the book of John to try to prove historically that Jesus um, was real and that Jesus walked, we can get some, some things that prove it. Yeah, we definitely can but that should not be our main goal when reading the book of John. Matter of fact, the book of John is um, focused on a lot of things, but the Christology, what that means is the study of Christ, is at the center of everything else um, in this. Um, so, you know, we have, we have different accounts of who the author is. So in this, you know, we kind of talked about these. Um, we've talked about this idea of synoptic gospels and John. Essentially, the first three gospels are different than John. If you're interested, um, we've been recording, so you can go back and watch that. Um, but who is the author has a lot of debate, um, even though it wouldn't seem so. Because who do we assume wrote the book of John? John, yeah, I mean, you, you can't be more specific than putting the dude's name on the book. And it's John the Baptist, right? Is, is, that, is it John the Baptist? No, it's not John the Baptist. Um, but the thing is, if you read the book of John all the way through, he never says, hey, this is John writing an account of Jesus. No, we're in there. So how do we then assume who the writer is if the Bible never tells us Specifically, who it is. Well, one, tradition tells us that it's John the Apostle who writes it. Now, there is a lot of debate, but what I look to specifically to kind of gives me the check mark that it is who it is, is there was this man named Irenaeus. Um, he was a, um, if, you're, if you're from the Catholic tradition, he was a church father. Um, if you're not, he was just an early church leader who wrote very great things um, defending the faith. And one of the places he writes is this uh, title called Against Heresies. And in Against Heresies, he, he lays it out, not really defending it, but assuming that people know that John the Apostle wrote the book of John. Now, I also take this very credible because Irenaeus was a disciple of a man named Polycarp. Now, Polycarp was a direct disciple of John the Apostle. So... The, the study there clearly shows to me, especially how Irene writes, that when we open the book of John, we're opening to the book um, that John the Apostle wrote. Now, there's a difference between John the Baptist and John uh, the Apostle. Now, we know it's not John the Baptist because he died in the gospel story. So, um, you know, that kind of ends that there. But there, there's a lot of debate around, you know, was it, you know, this um, John, this community that John created? But really, if you look to the Bible, um, in the book of John, you'll never actually see the name of John mentioned. 
You'll never actually see the name of John. The only time you'll see it is when Jesus is introducing, or John is introducing the disciples, and he calls James and John the son of Zebedee. That was their father. So James and John. Now, all the other three Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, write about John. I mean, he's one of the most important. Matter of fact, if we look at the Synoptic Gospels, when Jesus takes three of his inner circle with him, who is it? It's Peter, James, and John. We, knowing that right there, we look at how um, the, the person who wrote John introduces the one character that's not mentioned by the other. It's uh, the one whom he loved. The one whom he loved. Over and over again, instead of the name John, we see the one in whom he loved. When they were going to, um, after Jesus had died and resurrected, and Mary came back and said, the tomb is empty, it says, the one whom he loved got there first. And we know that John and Peter were there. So, using the actual synoptic gospels, we can kind of prove that the author was, in fact, a disciple of Jesus. Now, that's important because if it's not, then the information, you know, we, we kind of have to start questioning, you know, where was it from? When was it from? But it clearly, I think as we study the actual Bible itself, shows us that, that John the Apostle wrote the book of John. Now, I know that's a lot, of, a lot of roundabout way of saying it, but I think historically and contextually we see that it's John the Apostle, right? Um, So that's kinda, that kind of is the, the introduction to where it's at and who is writing it. Um, now I want to look at when and where. So we know, matter of fact, from the illustration I just used, um, about the, we, we assume when we read um, that account of Peter and John running that John was younger. Then we assume that's why he said he got there first. Is because at that point, Peter was pretty, I mean, he was not a young um, um, stallion. He, he was kind of up in age. So um, we assume that when John, when this happened, John was around 20. He was around 20 when Jesus had died. He was um, the youngest uh, apostle, the youngest disciple. But we assume when this letter was written that he was about 85 to 95. This is old. Um, I mean, that is old for our time. It's definitely old for them. It, especially reading his accounts, there's a lot of things that he went through. But, but there's a lot of cues that point us to... Two-sided markers. Why, why do we have two-sided markers? Just give me two. So we're going to look at when and where... So when and where is it written? So we know it's at the end of the first century because there's a lot of cues in the, in the, the text of John. And when we get there, we'll see. And that's really when a lot of historical analysis will come in because, um, for example, um, when Jesus heals the lame man, um, when he goes to um, his parents and the leaders say, you know, is this, is this your son? They say, don't ask us, ask our son. We're not trying to get in the middle of this. Now, now when this happened in Jesus' time, that really wouldn't have made much sense. Like, there, there, was, no, there, was, no, there was no difficulty between uh, the temple and what Jesus was doing. But for John, writing in the end of the first century, there was a lot of things that was happening. There was persecution of Christians that's already came and gone. Um, Paul has, has, has lived and died. A lot of the early leaders lived and died, persecuted under Nero, persecuted under Domitian. They were, they were in and out. Um, in fact, the Jews were, were given this thing that said, okay, you either got to hold true to the Christians as brothers, or you got to be against them. If you choose to, we're going to kill you as well. So there's this stark contrast that we see in, in the background of the book of John. Now, this is where we start getting into the... Well, to restate the analogy I was telling them, uh, my professor uses when we study the Bible or study anything, 
we're looking at a large forest of trees. Now, as we start getting more specific, we start um, you know, cutting out a lot of the trees, cutting out a lot of the trees, getting closer and closer, until eventually we get down to one tree. And within that tree, you get to one stick or one limb. Now, studying the Bible is kind of like that. We start with this idea of where the gospel is, um, and we get closer and closer. Now, here's where we're getting maybe to the one tree, where we see what actually is going on behind the book. This is where a lot of historical studies come in, and a lot of places that most, most uh, just normal Christian classes don't study because um, we, we can kind of go through it. But if you're getting ready to look, the importance of why I'm saying this, the importance of the, if you were to go look at the book of Galatians, if you were to go to look at um, 1 Peter, if you were to go to look at um, you know, James or even the Old Testament, if you were to look at the minor prophets or Genesis or Leviticus, if you're going to do this, backgrounds are very important to understanding the book you're about to open. Because knowing when and where this was written gives us a context so when we get to a story and we're like, that's weird. We don't just say, that's weird and keep going. We say, that's weird. Oh yeah, you know, I wonder if it's because in that time these things were happening. And it's when we steep the story of the Bible in its historical context that we see a lot deeper of what is going on. Um, so the, the when and where, um, we assume this, this, the Bible is one of the last things written, I think the last thing written, um, in the, what we call the canon of the New Testament, which seems crazy because if we think of it chronologically, it would be the fourth book written, but it's not. And um, we, once again, we'll get into seeing more of why we know it's really the late first century and stuff like that. But it's with it's the late first century that, that John wrote this. Now, one, he was a really old man. He was an old man. He couldn't write very well. So we know more than likely he dictated it, which just meant he told someone. Now, for us, it's like, oh, what do you mean John didn't actually write it? Well, no. Most of the letters we have weren't actually written by the person who said it. It's this thing called dictation. If I were to tell you this is what happened in my life, in this time, it was not really your liberty to expand upon what I said. It was you writing down exactly what I was saying. So we know, even though John did not write this with his hand, we can assume that it was exactly what he said. And, and, and this just you know shows that this is truly God-breathed, even if it's not God writing it with his own hand. So, where is a big question. I, mean, I, I struggle with even wanting to uh, um, include this. But the where essentially is within the area of the early ministry. And a lot of people believe it was in the area of Ephesus. You know, that's, matter of fact, it's what we're going through the book of the Ephesians. Um, there was a, or this big church movement. I don't really think so. But I also really don't know where else it would be. So I don't have much to say on that part. And I don't really think it has much to say with how we understand a lot of the stories because it's a moving narrative with Jesus. When you say Ephesus, is that in relationship to Jerusalem or um, Nazareth where in that vicinity? Um, well, it's, it's upper. It's at the top of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, or believe. Syria or up, up, that, up that direction? Um, Let's see. Well, yeah. I don't know what modern places would be. Turkey? <laughs> um, I was curious. The Bible that has maps. Yeah, well, welcome. Yeah, you can look at that map right there. Ephesus. Oh, okay. Or Jerusalem. See our Syria. Gotcha. Yeah, so that's kind of where maybe this Bible is written. But I think, I think it, it really, it's taken place in the context of a Christian Persecuted and Christian lived livelihood. Um, this is kind of John writing for the persecuted Christians who have maybe gone through or are going through this. Whether that's in Ephesus or whether that's in another country around there, I can't say for sure. Um, but I want to look at some of the characteristics of John. Um, I mentioned this early, earlier, but these are some of the things that we need to keep in mind. Um, it's simple, 
simple, but complex. So when I say it's simple, but complex, it means that this is one of the easiest places to start reading the Bible. And, we'll, and because of that, it's one of my favorite books of the Bible. Hello. It's really easy to read. But as we start, I mean, just think about the first section of John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. I mean, that is a hugely complex idea that you could spend weeks studying. Essentially, he opens up, and instead of, in the Synoptic Gospels, saying Jesus was the son uh, of Adam, and then um, you know, Seth, or whoever, all the way down to his great-grandfather's grandfather's father. Instead of doing that, he says Jesus was always, and is always. Okay, that's alright. That's not very simple, you might say. But when we read it, we're like, okay, yeah, I understand that. And once again, it's on that level of simplicity that we get in, and it's that idea of complex that we dig in, okay? Uh, so, you know, it's important to see it that way. Um, one of the interesting characteristics of the book of John we'll get into is there's really not that many parables, um, weird enough, but um, there are lengthy accounts of works followed by lengthy um, Followed by words. Essentially, um, this thing happened, here's why. This thing happened, then this thing happened. This thing happened, here's a sermon about Jesus. Sorry. This thing happened, here's some long exposition. Um, which changes, once again, the characteristics we have to know why and understand and see this difference. If you look at the Synoptic Gospels, one of the most important words in there is the kingdom of heaven was light. Remember when we studied the parables? That was a core point of the parables. The kingdom of heaven is light. Because Jesus was explaining what it was that his ministry was, and also what it was that was to come. But John, that's not really his focus here. It is to a certain extent, but it's not um, his, his overarching theme. He's just trying to show this idea, and which leads into... Um, the third characteristic is that Jesus in the Gospel of John is very personal. He's very personal. A lot of times in the book of John, Jesus is just off by himself. Now, one of these things is to cast that idea that Jesus on earth was often a lonely person. But we got to think, not very many people liked him. In every city he went to, there were some who bowed down to him as God. But there was a lot of them who wanted to kill him. That was why he had this thing called uh, the ministry of secrecy. Uh, he said, you know, just, you know, don't tell anybody. Because if you tell somebody, they're going to gonna try to kill me even harder. Okay? So you're welcome for being saved. You're welcome for being healed. But let's just keep going on with our lives. It paints this uh, personal image of Jesus. But it also has a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations. I think one of the most important um, is, is the conversation with Nicodemus. It's a big story. As a matter of fact, Nicodemus even shows up after his death um, and before his resurrection. But in the book of John, we see a lot of this personal, personable aspects of Jesus. And because of that, when we study it, we'll see a little bit deeper of how those impact differently than just reading parables. Now, I think, I think this is one of the most important um, characteristics of the book of John, is it's Theological, oh, keeps you in the wrong way. I think the book of John is very theologically based. I think one of the reasons John wrote this book was so that people would know who Jesus was in the context of of God and his divinity. Because there was no question really that Jesus was alive. Now that's really a big part of current, well not really current because now people really, there's no debate that Jesus was alive, it's clear. But you know, back minus 10 years and going back maybe 40 or 50, there was this big thing, you know, um, 
this big book called Case for Christ. People were trying to prove that Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was this person and that he lived and all these things. And John just assumed. You know why? Because he followed the man. Like, like he's writing to people who are like, oh yeah, that Jesus guy. I remember him doing stuff in my town when I was a kid. There's no trying to prove deeply that Jesus was a person. What he's trying to explain is the nature in which Jesus was. The nature in which Jesus was. And because of that, there's a lot of deep theological base in the book of John. Now, like I said, we open up with a very theological saying that Jesus was not just a um, descendant of this Levitical nation, or this, this promise through David and through Abraham and through all of his descendants, but he is God himself. He is fully divine. That's how the book of John starts out, is in this context. Um, just to show that, because with, when John had written his gospel, he would have seen the Synoptic Gospels. They, they would have already been, they would not have been widespread by any means. Um, you know, maybe one church maybe had Matthew, and if they were lucky, you know, Luke. And another church had Mark. And another church had, you know, maybe just Matthew. And maybe some of the other letters of Paul or these things. But John was writing to a people who knew Jesus' claim in his life. But he's writing, what did Libby say? So that you would believe. He's not writing so that you can have a case for Christ's um, actuality. He's writing, so that you will believe, which is also very evangelistic. So not only is it the theologically based, but the theology is based upon evangelism. So when we read the book of John, that is why it's so simple, but so deep, so complex. Because John is writing, so that these people would believe the whole part of Jesus. That's why we see some, some weird things happening in the book of John that we don't see in other ones. Um, I'd said earlier that Christology was a big part of John's writing. Um, and what I mean by that is that Christology just means, simply means the study of Christ. Um, in the Synoptic Gospels, it's really an account of Christ. It's an account of Jesus and his um, living. You know, it's the parables he wrote, when he wrote, or when the uh, parables he said, when he said them, uh, the context, maybe the stories, the people that he interacted with, the way that the disciples came to be. But John throws all of that out. One, I believe, assuming that a lot of people had known, but two, getting down to the point of why Jesus is still being followed after Nero, after um, Domitian, after people had lived and died, after people had been tarred and fired, and after people had, be, had been burned and crucified, and after people had been tortured, and after people had gone through all of this, why do they still believe in this person named Jesus? And it's because of the theology that Jesus is. It's not just because it was a cool guy. It's not just because he was alive. But it's because of theology within Jesus. That is what separates the book of John from the Synoptic Gospels. I believe that is, I, I believe, reading it, and we'll see, you more welcome to have your own opinion on these different characteristics. But I think that's the background for the sticks that we're about to study. I think that is the background of the tree that we're looking at, known as the book of John. Theology, the study of God, the study of Christ, the study of these things. Theology just simply means the study of God. Theo meaning God, ology uh, meaning study. The study of God. This is the background that we are getting into. And it's important to realize that because, like I said in the beginning, if we try to read this like a historical account, we can't. There's no doubt these are historically true things, but that's not really the point of why John is writing. John is writing so that we would believe and we would know. 
So that I think is kind of is kind of the big picture, but it's the small picture of the book of John in the place of the Gospels. Now, this is kind of uh, all the background work I'm doing. Now, there's a lot more background work we can be doing, but what I want to point out is why we did this. Just for a minute here, just for a few minutes as we're getting close. Why we did this, because if we read John as a synoptic gospel, we're not going to understand it. If we read John um, is not the person who's the beloved disciple, we're not going to see the connection. When he says beloved disciple, he's not saying the, the most chosen. He's saying the one who humbly was called his closest one in reality when he should not have been. It's very humble. Even though when we read it, we don't really get the humility of the cross. It seems pretty whatever. When and where we're written, why we need to know this? Because when we get to something... And we say, that really doesn't make sense for the time period. But we can say, well, remember, it was written in the late first century. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Um, it's simple but complex. I say that because we're getting ready to get into a book, and if we read it as simple, if we read it as surface level, we're going to miss the complex. But if we look at the complexity, we're going to miss the simplicity of it. That happens a lot in deep theological or deep biblical studies. You get so into verse 4a, verse 4b and verse 6, that you miss the, the flow that is written. You miss the, the simplicity that it is. And finally, I think one of the most important backgrounds is what we're getting into. Why? What was the point of the author's writing? And the book of John, I believe, is for a theological understanding. Now, this is something you need to look at every day. I, I, I go through this, one, to understand what we're getting into the book of John, but two, Introduce you to what it looks like to study a background for a book. So if we were to study um, the book of Galatians, we would know what needs to separate Galatians from Ephesians and Romans and 1st and Corinthians and what separates it from the New Testament. We need to know that Paul is the author. We need to know um, when it was written and, and where it was written so we see the relationship um, there. And we need to know how it's read um, you know, in the book of Galatians. What, is it written as a gospel? Is it written as a story? No, is it written as um, um, explanation? Yeah. And finally, um, simply what the author, a uh, big point, is. Now, that is a lot of stuff and a lot of talking. So I'm going to shut up for a minute and ask, do you guys have any questions or maybe statements, not even questions that you just find interesting um, that you want to talk about? Was a lot of the... books written after the first century is um, no actually uh, none of the books were actually written after the first century um, everything that we have in the New Testament canon was written between well 30 not zero but 30 AD and I believe about 90 or a little bit earlier 80 so in that period where we have all the New Testament I guess and that was the original, original writings. The original writings in Greek. It was processed later, right? I mean, the compilation was put together. The New Testament? Later. Well, even the books. Didn't, wasn't there like a group of people got together and said, we got to go through this? Well, there's a group of people about 300 years later, roughly 300 years later, it said, look at this book called Matthew, this book called Luke, this book called the Gospel of Thomas, and they compiled them into the canon, which meant the measuring stick um, of the New Testament. Um, but they didn't add to any of the books or take them. Well, I don't believe they were added to because we, we have um, uh, little uh, accounts of the first century writings. We have John dated back to like 100 A.D. So we know it couldn't have been written after 100 A.D. because we clearly have, even if it's just a small section, archaeological proof that shows that... In fact, we have a few more minutes left. Um, but yeah, so later the books that were already written were collected into the New Testament. But it's within that 30 to 90 year range that the authors actually wrote the, the 
Come on. Come on. So, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I, I can see how they can accurately write down things that happened right around Jesus' death and stuff. That's still pretty close to memory and stuff. But all the things in the Old Testament, where'd that come from? The Old Testament had already been written um, hundreds and hundreds of years. Hundreds for some, yeah, thousands for others. Um, so the, the Torah, or the, the Jewish Bible, as you would say, theirs is the Old Testament. It was already around. It was already there. It was already um, kind of going on. That's why, um, you know, in every synagogue they would have studied it. That's why Jesus, you know, quoted it so much because he was a Jew growing up. He did Jewish things, which meant he memorized most, if not all, of the Old Testament. Um, so that was already that was already together. Um, if you want to be technical, it wasn't until. Christians claim the Old Testament, the Jews said, no, that's our testament. And that was one of the big separations between their Bible and our Old Testament. But, you know, and that what they read a lot was the first books, like uh, Genesis, and all those uh, first five or six there was there kind of like the basis for everything. Yeah, the first five books, the Torah, was very important to um, their study. And we see it um, kind of be a basis for uh, a lot of New Testament stuff. But yeah, the Torah would have been studied by Jewish um, synagogues at that time, as well as other, you know, minor prophets, major prophets, songs, other things. Um, but the Torah was definitely the basis of everything else uh, in that time. In the books, the chapters and the verses that's pretty much all man made. I mean, mm -hmm. if it's not, sometimes, you know, stuff ends kind of funny. Yeah, like you'll see every now and then as we go through it, and, and I've done it in my sermons as well. My, my context is verse, chapter 3, verse 28 through chapter 3, verse 1. Because for whatever reason, the people going back tried to simplify it, and for a majority of them, they did. Um, adding verse numbers and adding chapter numbers, it really did help a lot. But in some places, it's, it's a little long. I mean, you can't really expect someone to go through the whole Bible and get every single breakdown perfectly right. So there's a couple places here and there that it's like, okay, that, like it's still the same context here, but okay. Um, but yeah, you know, when John wrote it, he did not say chapter 1, verse 1. He just wrote in the beginning. And ended at the end. He didn't say that. But he just wrote all the way through. So yeah, that's a good point. It, it's very important when we study it as well as to look beyond maybe the numbers. Any other thoughts? Any other things people want to bring up? Okay. If not, that's fine. Um... Once again, I'll put this online on YouTube and we'll get to making it if you want to go back and look at anything I said. Because like I said, I, I talked for quite a while. I felt a little parched. But um, hopefully you guys learned something. And hopefully you guys have a good um, introduction to the actual book of John. An introduction to what a background study of a book looks like. Um, but we're going to... Yeah, you have a question. Yeah. All these... Symbols that we were talking about last week, the uh, helmet, the breastplate, and all that, is or are each one like John represents one, or he's just setting the basis for the rest of them. Uh, to explain uh, the next book, is it cover the breastplate, or the next one after that, the helmet? I mean, that are you following me? Um, is each book okay. leading up to all the armor of God or explaining a piece of it well the armor of God is in the book of Ephesus and Paul wrote it as just a little illustration um, what I'm going to be doing is taking the armor of God which is just a small illustration and taking it out deeper you know, so, like putting other texts in the Bible beside it to make it a little bit deeper. 
Um, but no, the armor of God was just kind of a, a one-off yeah. illustration used by Paul in the book of Ephesus. So, this is the introduction to the book of John, which we're going to be looking through sort of verse by verse, sort of topic by topic as we go through insert into study here. Alright, well, if there's no other questions, or I'm going to go ahead and, and pray, which you're more welcome to ask me questions afterwards. But let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Let's bow. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we can come together. God, thank you for the book of John that we have to be able to study. God, I pray that as we go throughout it and as we look deeper into its words, God, I pray that we would come to know you on a deeper level. God, I pray that it would be something that we can, can use in our daily life and use in our uh, ministry to others. God, I want to thank you so much for your son and the life that he lived and the life that he gave up so that we can live on. God, I pray that you'd be with us for the rest of the service. In your name we pray.